Welcome to the Abacus tutorial, Random Vibration Analysis. Today we're gonna to cover random vibrations. First, let's try to understand what random vibrations really are. So some spacecraft components may require calculating the fatigue life of parts on the periodic vibration input, which is quite straightforward because we know uh, very well how the input of the forcing function is gonna change over time. As it, as it is periodic or harmonic. However, vibrations may be random in nature in a wide range of applications. And the loads could be arbitrary. Instantaneous vibration amplitudes are not highly predictable as the amplitude at any given point is not related to any other point during time. So this lack of periodic behavior makes random vibration a unique problem. Some load environments must be treated as a random phenomenon when the forces involved are controlled by non-deterministic parameters. Here are some examples where random vibrations could occur. High frequency engine thrust oscillations, aerodynamic buffeting of fairing, the aerodynamic turbulence, sound pressure on the surface of the payload, or even an earthquake ground motion, acoustic excitation due to rocket and gen engine noise. In these examples, the motions, motions vary randomly with time, and so we cannot express the amplitude in a deterministic mathematical function that we had done earlier uh, in other problems, where you can use the Fourier series to express a periodic signal. The most obvious characteristics of random vibration is that it's not periodic. So a knowledge of the past history of the random motion does not tell you what the motion is going to be in the future. So we have to rely on the probability of occurrence of the various accelerations and deflections to be able to figure out what the stretch is really going to do. Spacecraft structures and appendages are typically subject to base excited random vibration. Random vibration, therefore, needs to be described using statistical approaches. And the structural response then is found through statistics. The time domain information, which is gonna look like this, this time domain information, what we can do is to classify these amplitudes into bands. And this will give us the number of occurrences of these magnitudes. One approach is to take the time domain information and express it as a power spectral density that will characterize the frequency content of the process. Usually, the power spectrum density is units of g squared per hertz per acceleration, and this information is given in terms of frequency. The area under this curve corresponds, the square root of the area under this curve corresponds to the GRMS. The higher the RMS, the more damage we could be causing to the structure. Here's a more complicated power spectral density, and it also depends on the frequency, as you can see here. The PSD indicates the RMS vibration levels at various frequencies. The PSDs can be obtained from field data or given as measurements by a launch vehicle provider. In the finite element analysis procedure, you will define the finite element model. Then you will perform the model analysis and extract the frequency, the natural frequencies along with the mode shapes. This information is used with the random vibration analysis, and you're gonna then input a PSD, which we can first determine the PSD from time domain information, or using a PSD spec by the launch vehicle provider or a standard. Then, after you do this, you can then calculate the RMS response and use it for a fatigue calculation. And pass it along to uh, our invited guest le lecturer today, Li Fu Wang, who's gonna walk us through the Abacus tutorial. Thank you, Professor. Now we are going to apply these concepts and see how to use Abacus to model random vibration responses. So we're going to apply the abacus to do two problems. The first one is a 
typical cantilever beam, <clears throat> who has a length of one meters and the cross section area is 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. The material property is steel, which has Young's modulus of two, <clears throat> 210 gigapascal, 0.3 Poisson's ratio, and 8,000 kilograms per meter cube. The analysis range we are going to use is from 20 hertz to two, uh, 2,000 hertz, and 10% structure damping was going to be used. And we're going to use 10 moles uh, to do the analysis. And the entire beam is split into 10 elements, and the element type is B23, which is cubic, um, <clears throat> two node cubic beam element. According to Johnson, in his book, Linear Dynamic Analysis, Random Response, and in 1978, he has a theoretical result for the input uh, power spectrum density like this. <clears throat> and the output, according to the literature, should look like this. And we're going to see, compare the abacus result and the literature result to validate that our analysis is is correct. So here's the abacus part. Create a 2D object, being 2D wine and one for that. And use zero, zero and one, zero to create the wire. And in your property, create a steel with density of 8,000 kilograms per meter cube and uh, Young's modulus 210 E9 Pascal and 0.3 Poisson's ratio. Create a section, beam section. And create a cross-section area our cross-section area is a rectangle with 0.1 and 0.1, a square cross-section. So section Poisson's ratio 0.3. Assign the section. Don't need to assign, uh, don't need to create sets. And then create the direction. Since the two dimensions are the same, so it doesn't really matter where is the dimensions. So we just use the default value. And now the step. First, we need to do model analysis to obtain the resonant frequencies and the mode shape, corresponding mode shape in the linear perturbation frequency. And we only need 10 moles from that. So just enter 10. And now create the random vibration response. Random response under linear perturbation. Our lower frequency analysis frequency is 20. Upper is 2,000. And we can make it a little bit finer Let's put a uh, 30 here. And the VS, we make it one. So it's one means it's linearly distributed in the logarithm scale. So now we assign the structure damping from mode one to mode 10. All of them has a damping constant of 0.1. And uh, and now we can go to the field response. Since we are going later, we are going to obtain the stress. We can actually select the stresses here, so that this will be passed to the random vibration response. But just in case, we can select all the stresses. 
so that you won't miss anything. And Abacus will automatically select the one that is useful. And here, uh, we the output part, we have the acceleration, uh, the strain, the stress, uh, velocity, and the displacement. That's pretty enough here. But later, probably, you can add the one meter stress. And now, in the load, uh, sorry, we forgot to create a section. So create the independent section instant from that. And then at the load, first we create the uh, cantilever beam. So for cantilever beam in the initial, we select the fixed end. This is a fixed end and apply the fixed boundary condition. Uh, now we create the vibration input. So select uh, your random vibration response step and apply the acceleration based motion. Since we're going to apply the U2 for vibration, we are specifying the correlation and since we are doing only one degrees of freedom, it doesn't matter if you select what, we just select uncorrelated. And here, if you right click, you can create the SPD definition, uh, sorry, PSD definition. And now select the gravity and 9.81 as the gravity constant. For real part, we can follow this graph Select this point, this point, this point, and this point to represent the input. So as the frequency for that is 20, 52, 900, 2000. So we add four row for that. And then 20, 52, 900, 2000. The corresponding value, since we are not introducing any phase change, we just enter real value which is 0 0.02, 0 0.53, uh, sorry, 0 0.053, and 0 0.053, and 0 0.0022. 0 0.02, uh, 0 0.053, 0 0.053, and 0 0.0022. All the imaginary parts is zero. Now the real, since we already uh, in, uh, input the cor corresponding value, we don't need to make any amplification here, just make it one and no phase change zero for imaginary part. Once it's done, let's go to the mesh. So your element type here, right now is B21, which is two non linear, uh, linear for in a plane. So we change it to cubic. So now it's a cubic album. So we do point 0.1 since we want 10 elements inside the spin. And then we do the mesh. Now we can create a job called bin one. Submit. Oh, I think when I assign the, I forgot to assign the uh, direction. Since the two dimensions are the same, so we just leave it default. And do remember to click OK for that to make sure it's assigned. Now submit. Since we're not opting any history response, we can just click OK and wait until they finished. Let's see the result first. So the theoretical result shows that it has a peak at around here, which is around nine or eight, 90 or 80, between 80 and 90, closer to 90. And the maximum is a little slightly above the 10, 1e e minus 10, uh, 1e e minus 8. 
and it has a second peak at a frequency of around two, three, four, five, around 500 something. And the value for that is around 1e minus 11. This two should be the resonant frequency for the structure. And once it's done, we can see the results. And here first, let's see the resonant frequency. So you can see the first mole has a frequency of 82. So, which is very close to what we have for theoretical result, this one. And the second mode is around 518. So very close to this one. So these two modes are included in this response. Now we can see the response by getting a XY data create from the field output and here we can select the displacement U2, which is what we want. And here we select the unique nodal. nodal. And to pick the node that we're interested, we choose the free end, which has the largest displacement. Click this edit selection and then select this from the viewpoint and click down. One node is selected. And then here, active step, we don't need a model analysis anymore, we just need a random response. So plot it. Now you can see the result. The result is a little bit coarse since our number of steps in between the frequency is not too much. But you can clearly see the value here. To probe the value, we do tours query and then probe values. And we can probe this one. You can see that it's at 82, which is your resonant frequency, and the value is a little bit more than 1e e minus 8, which is the same as this one. And the second value, the frequency is 518, which is close to this one, and the value is 3.5 e minus 13 which is uh which is a uh, wrong uh sorry 3.5 minus 12 so which is around this point and it's very close to this one smaller a little bit smaller than uh 1 e minus 11 so if you want it to be more accurate, you can see the higher response is not that much accurate. So if you want it to be accurate, you can always have finer mesh to it. And so that your mode shade of the resonant frequency will be more accurate. Now, since we validate our data, oh, another thing for showing the result is in your option, X, Y option, axis. <clears throat> uh, originally, the default is linear. Now we change it to log logarithm plot. And we can also change the scale compared to this one, which is from minus 17 to minus 7. Minus 7 to minus, minus 17 to minus 7. And for X, definitely you can follow this one. It's from 10 to a thousand. So from 10. But for Abacus, since our analysis only apply from zero to, sorry, from 20 to two, a thousand. So if you put 10 here, you can see there's a zero, zero at 10. And directly connecting to the start point of our analysis. So it's better to show just the analysis step from 20. Now, since the model is validated, we're going to move on to the second problem which is a typical cantilever being attached with a mass at the end, at the free end, who has a, with a value of 0.2 kilograms. The length for the beam is 0.15 meters, and the cross-section area is 0.015 in width and seven millimeters in height. So the beam is made of aluminum, who has a Young's modulus of 68.9 gigapascal. 
the Poisson ratio is 0.3 and the density is 2700 kilograms per meter cube. The analysis range we are going to apply here is 20 to, from 20 to 200 hertz with a 5% direct model damping, 10 moles required. And to show the actual stress distribution, we actually build a 3D model here. So the element we are going to use is uh, three uh, is the eight node brick element <clears throat> with the incompatible incompa incompatible mode. We are going to input uh, acceleration uh, power spectrum density, which is shown here from twenty two hundred, and all the value is point four seven five. And now let's see how do we do that in Abacus. Create a 3D beam first. And the plasma size just put 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. Use the uh, square toolbox put 0, 0 here and length is 0.15, height is 0 0.007. And the extrusion is the width direction is 0 0.015. This is your beam. Now assign the material property, aluminum, density is 2770 kilograms per meter cube. Young's modulus 68.99, Poisson's ratio 0.3. And assign the section solid homogeneous because this is a 3D, uh, 3D uh, geometry. Sorry, now assign the section to our geometry. Now we create assembling the instant, independent instance. So later we're going to apply the mass at the, exactly the center of the instant. So to do that, we need to split the instant into four parts. And to do that, we can create the datum planes first. First, we create an xy plane and split that in xy direction. Uh, so we do xy, x, sorry, xy plane, and then offset is half of the width, which is 0 0.0075, which is in the middle of the plate. So we create another xz plane, and emit, and the value should be half of the height, so 0 0.0035. Now we use this to a long click and select this one. Partition self using datum plane. Select this datum plane and enter. You see that it's split. And select all the cell and then enter. Select this datum plane, enter. And you see that it's split into four parts. Now create a step. Similar to previously, first we do model analysis, which is uh, linear perturbation frequency. Only 10 value is needed. And uh, now create a, uh, the random response. So random vibration response. So now we start from 20 and at 200, let's just make it 10 to make the result faster. Cause now we're doing 3D almond. If you make it large, it will take a long time. Still logarithm. And this time we're going to assign the direct model damping 5%. So direct model damping from first mode to the 10th mode with 5% critical damping. 
and same as previously in your field output if you want to apply the stress you need to click uh, check stress here and here what we output is uh, other than this one, we also include this one, root mean square of stresses. And I'll show you why we include that. So in your interaction, we assign the inertia here uh, in the special inertia manager. So we can create a new one called point mass since this mass, we are going to uh, use a 0.2 kilograms point mass representing this mass. So point mass and then select the point we just created here. And the value should be 0.2 kilograms now we go to the load same as previously first we need to fix the end fix this end to make it a cantilever beam so select all four faces and last one now it's fixed and create an input for your random response Acceleration response, same as previously, we want U2, so U2 vibration, and then uncorrelated, since we only have one degree of freedom, and right-click this one, and create PSD definition, PSD definition, and this time, we only need two points for that. One is 20, one is 200, and the value is 0.475. So 0 0.475, 0 0.475, 20, 200. And I imagine part is just zero. Select that to be gravity based and enter the gravity 9.81 here. Now real is one, imagine it's zero. We are not changing the face. And now our input is, is, is fine. Do the mesh. Global size, we assign a two millimeter global size and then mesh the insum. And in your element type, the default is reduce integration. So it's C3D8R. We change it to incom incompatible modes, which is C3D8I. This can greatly change, inc increase your response in bending. And now in your job, create a job, call it being two. And we're not opening any history response, so just leave it there. This is a 3D model, so it should be way slower than the previous one. And let's see what we expect to see. According to the previous result, we are expecting to see a peak at the resonant frequency, similar to this one. And, and our response, we want to see the root mean square of the response. So the root mean square Basically, it's your power density, uh, power spectrum density. Do the integration of the spectrum, and then take square root to it. And it has a time domain meaning for that. But you can see also see the unit here. The original input unit is g squared divided by hertz. So if you do integration, it will become g squared and then take square root, it will become g, which, which is your acceleration. So if you can get the power spectrum density for your stress, do integration and take square root, you can get the unit of Pascal. 
and I'll show you two ways to get the rooming square of your uh, stresses here. And what we're interested the most is at the fixed end, because that will have the largest, uh, <clears throat> largest stress. And definitely we are more interested at the top or bottom surface, because only at the top, as you know, in bending theory, in the neutral plane, the stress sigma one is zero. So we are interested in maximum stress, which is top or bottom. And uh, if you want to see the maximum deflection, definitely it happens at the end. But if you want to see the stress, we will choose the fixed end, which has the largest um, stress because it has the largest moment. Now since it's complete, let's see the result. You can see that the stress here is zero while the stress here on the top surface has the maximum value. And if you see, let's see the resonant mode first. For the first resonant frequency is about 56. So we are expecting to see some resonant frequency, uh, so some peak at 56 Hertz. And the second mode is 120. But if you see the mode shape, you can see that it's a bending mode through the Z direction. But since our input is Y direction, we won't expect to see any peak at 120 Hertz. If you, you see the third mode, the frequency is already a southern hertz but since our analysis is only end at uh, 200 hertz so we won't see anything for your third mode now let's see the spectrum same as previously xy data manager and create from field output and first let's see the stress first Let's just see S11. Choose unique node, pick from viewpoint, select any point on this end and on the top surface. Let's just select the very left corner. And active splat, we don't need a model one, we only need the RVR. So plot it. It's clear that Let's probe the value. It's clear that around the resonant frequency, we get the maximum uh, of the stress. The reason we cannot, uh, the reason we cannot get exactly at the resonant frequency is we may not have the sampling point there. <clears throat> so the value for that is around 3.33 e. 14 and the unit for that should be Pascal square over Hertz. So two way to do, uh, there are two way to get the rooming square for that. As I mentioned before, if you do integration of this plot and then take square root, you can get the rooming square. To do that, we can do create and operate on XY data and enter the formula here as square root of integrate of this value. This curve stands for the curve you just have. Double click that and two ending bracket. Plot the expression, you can see the value here. This is your rooming square is converging to a fixed number. If you probe the value, At the end, it should be around 56 megapascal. That will be your rooming square uh, of the stress, of your bending stress, sigma one. The other way to do it is directly create from the field output. Remember, we just output the variable root, rooming square of the stress component. We select the sigma one and or 
the same point here, if you plot it, you can see that you can probe the value for that one. It's around 56, which is the same as what we obtained previously. And And if you see the, how the result is, you can see that with different frequency, you can see different response. Some of them may have large deflection, some of them may not. That's all in frequency domain, not in time domain. So now I will hand it back to Professor Goyao and he will show you how are you going to use those results for further prediction of the fatigue. Thank you, Lifu. Now we're gonna go ahead and use the RMS trace quantities to try to predict the fatigue life of this particular beam. We're gonna use the three band technique along with a minus cumulative damage ratio. The equivalent, equivalent RMS stress is generally used for the fatigue calculation and it was calculated to be 58 megapascals. So we're gonna use the Gaussian distribution. 58 megapascals and, one, and the RMS stress corresponds to the one sigma value. So the one sigma value is going to occur 68.3% of the time. The two sigma values, which is two times 58, will occur 27% of the time. And then finally, the three sigma values, which is three times 58, will occur about 4% of the time. This information can be used to determine the fatigue life of the component. Here, what we find is that we calculated a stress of 58.23. This is the RMS stress. Twice of 58 is 116. Three times 58 is 174. So these are percentages of occurrence using, using statistics, assuming a Gaussian distribution. Now we're gonna use uh, the stress that was calculated and use the SN curve. The SN curve is then used to determine the life, the maximum life for each of these stress levels. At one RMS, we find the number of cycles to failure. For twice the RMS, we're gonna find the number of cycles to failure. And three times the RMS will give us the number of cycles to failures. These number of cycles to failures will be later used in the miners calculation. And so now we can calculate a number of cycles for that stress level for four hours and 56 Hertz. We know the dominant frequency is 56 Hertz. So 56 Hertz times the operational time, which is four hours times 60 minutes times 60, 60 seconds, you, you can then determine the operational time and then multiply it by the percentage occurrence. So we know that for the dominant frequency, for this operational time and for this percentage occurrence, we can then determine the number of cycles for each of these stress levels. Here, we have 68% of one sigma occurring. So we have 68% here, the operational time, and then the dominant frequency. This information tells us the number of cycles for each of these stress levels. We can now apply the miners rule in this manner, we have the number of cycles that was calculated during this operational time and the number of cycles to failure at each of these stress levels. And then from there, we can calculate the equivalent damage due to these ratios. And in this case, we find that for one RMS level, it does very little damage, even though the effect lasts for 68% of the time. While the majority of the damage is really caused by the higher stress level, although it occurs only 4% of the time. While the fatigue life evaluation on the random process is highly complicated, miners rules provides a reasonable good prediction. A recommended value of D for high cycle fatigue, you don't like to have D bold to exceed more than 0.1 for high cycle fatigue. Although values up to 0.25 and 0.5 can be accepted, if there's enough test data to provide high confidence in the design. I hope you found value in this tutorial. Have a great day.